since 1981. And now, here's your host. Welcome back to the program, Mom Zev Brennan. We're very privileged and pleased that Jeffrey Lichman joins us. He's one of the top criminal defense attorneys in the United States. He's been practicing over 30 years. He had some very high profile cases. John Gotti, El Chapo recently. He's represented so many different kinds of clients and he's been really praised for his brilliant work. So, Jeffrey, thank you for joining us. We look forward to a spirited conversation, but thank you. Thanks for having me, Zev. Is it more difficult to practice criminal defense law today? Have the rules changed? The government got tougher playing all kinds of different games that they didn't play years ago. I spoke to Alan Dersh, it seems to have it changed landscape today. I think it's gotten tougher because of the investigative means. That's the first thing. I mean, you can't get away with anything anymore because there's a camera everywhere. Um, you've got your phone in your pocket. They can figure out exactly where you are. Uh, so it's very difficult um, in terms of the uh, humongous amount of evidence that we didn't perhaps have 30 years ago. We had a lot back then, but now it's much tougher. And and the rules, the laws have changed as well. as It's made it tougher to defend somebody. The judges are not nearly as lenient as they used to be, um, at least during trials for me. So do more people or most people tend to take a plea bargain, even though they may not be guilty because it's easier and less expensive to go through a trial and we're not sure what's going to happen? I think that's always been the case to some degree. It's gotten worse the last five or 10 years, less and less people go to trial, um, mainly because they're just terrified of losing because the penalties are so high. But I still you know, get a decent amount of trials. And I think the conviction rate is like 98% in federal courts, and that includes plea deals. But we win half our trials. Um, it's not as bad as it seems. Um, I, I guess it depends on the case and depends on the defense lawyer. When you deal with a case like El Chapo, that's certainly a very tough case because all the negative publicity. And it seems that, you know, there there's a perception that the person is guilty before going to trial. So that makes your job more difficult. I think there's a perception in juries that the defendant is always guilty. With Chapo, it obviously was you know, 100 times worse. But uh, this is the way society is. Uh, people on a jury think that the defendant is guilty, and they're guilty until proven innocent, which, of course, is directly in contrast to what the uh, Constitution says. But look, sometimes the government doesn't offer you a deal that you can live with, and you're forced to go to trial. And some of my biggest wins have been cases in which they didn't give me a fair deal. I was forced to go to trial, and I walked the defendant out. For example, give us some cases. Well, that was Gotti, I would tell you, is one is that before the trial, they were convinced the government, the Southern District of New York, that they were getting a conviction. They offered us 16 years. He wanted five. Um, we went to trial because we had no choice. He got an acquittal and a hung jury. After that was over, he walked out of jail at that point. After that was over, they offered us five. At that point, we wanted the case dismissed. That happens a lot. I've had another case uh, in upstate New York a couple of years ago with a CEO of a business who assaulted a cop allegedly. It was a two-year mandatory minimum. They insisted upon three years. We went to trial and we got a hung jury and he walked out again. This is what this is the reason I go to trial mostly these days is because the government is so convinced they're going to win that they don't give us any chance on a plea. So we go to trial. Well you said they have a 98% success rate so they believe that they can go to trial and win. So the question is, why would even they give deals or they don't really give such great deals because they figure they got you if you go to trial? You know, that includes, first of all, it includes every plea deal, fair plea deal. So that's the bulk of the 96 or 97 percent. In addition, a lot of uh, lawyers are court appointed. They've got a million cases. They don't have the resources to fight. So they lose most of the time as well. As I said, I've win half my trials and this is going back 20 something years. I get a lot of fair plea offers now because they don't want to go to trial because I win a lot. So what's the point? Why take a chance? They give you a plea, they get rid of me and we go on to the next one. Now, are some of the protection that your clients have been eroded, including attorney-client privilege, have been eroded, there have been other rights, and sometimes the government, you read the government doesn't give you all the, when I say you, I mean just general attorneys, all the evidence that they're supposed to be turning over in a timely way. It seems like there is a stacked deck, which uh, you may be successful, but it just makes it much, much harder for somebody out there. You know, the government has always cheated, and I would say they probably cheat in every case to some degree. 
Um, it's not easy. I'm not going to lie to you and say this is easy work. If it was easy work, I'd be retired right now and I wouldn't be speaking to you. So we, we have to really fight doubly hard than perhaps we used to uh, because you have to catch their cheating and then you got to overcome it. And oftentimes judges don't care that the government cheats because they want a conviction as well. So, you know, you're up against it. When you start a trial, you've got the entire world against you. The jury's against you before the case starts. The government is certainly against you. The judge is against you. You've got the media against you. Society is against you. It's a very lonely feeling sometimes when you're standing up there um, defending uh, a client. But look, this is why you do it if you do this kind of work. There's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of uh, reward if you win. Now, one of the things that I hear from some of our listeners, and we have the largest Hasidic listening audience in the country, and I've spoken to Alan Dershowitz, another attorney, and Nat Lewin, and the perception is and the feeling is is that the Orthodox Jew or a Hasidic Jew, if he goes on trial in the federal courtroom, the deck, does, the, the deck is even stacked more against him or her. So therefore, you know, they would take a plea bargain in almost every case they feel they shouldn't go to trial at all. There's not even a question that that's true. Um, you know, this is what it is. You're in a society that is rife with anti-Semitism. Um, and I'm going to be impolite, perhaps, with some of my comments. Uh, but look, your audience yeah. deserves the truth. And they, they're desperate for the truth, and they should be. Uh, it's a wildly anti-Semitic community in New York City. And I don't care how many liberal Jews um, are, are, are for uh, the Democrats or for the society. The fact is they still hate the liberal Jews or regular Jews, conservative Jews, they hate you no matter what. So what happens is if you go in there um, wearing a yarmulke, appearing uh, Hasidic or Orthodox, the jury's got you convicted before you even start. So you have to make an effort to combat it. Now, I know that it's not self-loathing. I know people are going to say, you know, you're being self-loathing by saying, you don't want to appear Jewish, you got to hide it. Well, what I would say is you can take your ethics, you can take your morals, you can slap that yarmulke on your head, and you can spend 15 or 20 years in jail. Or if you'd like to fight, have a chance to fight and win, you have to think a little bit and, and understand uh, your audience. Well, the point is, though, if you're a modern Orthodox Jew, you took off your yarmulke, one thing, but if you're a Hasidic Jew, if you took off your yarmulke, you still have your beard, you have the side locks, you have your dress. So would you recommend that they shave and change their clothing if they were going on trial? You know, I hate to, to, to say that because it's just, it, it makes my skin crawl to think that as a Jew, Hasidic, Orthodox, uh, Reform, Conservative, whatever you are, that you have to hide yourself like it's Nazi Germany in 1939. But the fact is, this is what our society is. New York is horribly anti-Semitic right now. We know by all the hate crimes against Jews. So you have to decide what can you uh, stand um, in terms of your religion if you're willing to take that sort of step. I would suggest that in terms of the lawyer you choose, um, you know, hire somebody uh, that it does not appear uh, to be you know, and I can't, what a horrible thing to say, overly Jewish, but this is the society in we're in right now. If you want to put everything back after the trial, it's probably smart. You should do that. Um, but during a trial, it's hard enough to get a fair trial. You don't want to make it worse for yourself. But if they say they hired Jeffrey Lichman, Lichman is not exactly a wasp name too, right? No. <laughs> It's not, but, you know, I've had success uh, with many clients that uh, Jewish, not Jewish, it's never made a difference because I can speak to any jury and I don't think I come across, I come across as secular as can be. I don't think people, they very quickly, uh, if, they're, if they're Jew haters, they very quickly forget it when they hear me speak. And I, again, as I said, I've won, other than the Chapo case, I haven't lost the trial since 2008. That's a big deal. And, that is uh, a very big deal. So that's what you're there for. You want to win. You want to get out because if you get wrapped up in the criminal justice system, federal or state, whether it's New York or anywhere else, you're going to have big problems until you can wrangle yourself out of it. Have you encountered for any of your clients or seen this kind of anti-Semitism in display in the courtroom? Um, you know, I'll tell you one story. I had a, sure. a, a Jewish client, a CEO, I mentioned it before who was arrested uh, for assaulting a police officer. Uh, they had a million witnesses, the case seemed completely dead, and we had two year mandatory minimum. And when we had, we were picking the jury, uh, one of the jurors was a very white, uh, very pro uh, police town. One of the jurors was a black man from Haiti. 
And uh, I thought that he was very negative towards the government. And I was absolutely shocked when the prosecutor allowed him to stay on the jury. Well, we did the trial. I beat up uh, the witnesses on the stand. We got a hung jury. And I found out after who was the juror that led the charge to prevent the conviction. Well, it was the black juror from Haiti. And I turned to the prosecutor after it was over. And I said, I got to ask you a question. What were you possibly thinking, allowing a guy who was really against the police? You could have easily gotten rid of him. Why would you ever have allowed him to stay on the jury? And he said, well, you know, I figured we had a Jewish defendant, you know, blacks hate Jews. I figured he'd help me. Wow. I mean, he actually said that it was I was blown away. But, you know, this is what we're dealing with. The, the Jew hate isn't necessarily just in the jury and in the community. Sometimes it's in the government as well. Wow. Now, Jews obviously are a big presence in New York. But what you're saying is in the courtroom, one will find that discrimination. Is that also true from among the judges? Because New York is supposed to be, is perceived to be a very liberal place, but on the federal level, you're saying it's not so liberal as people think it, it is. Well, you know, I think that the federal judges are very anti criminal defendant. That's how it starts. Very rarely do you get a fair judge in my mind. You just have to try to overcome an unfair judge. I don't see anti Semitism. Um, in the judiciary in New York, at least, perhaps in other states in the South, you might get more of that because for the large part, there's a lot of Jewish judges that are still around. I mean, there's less and less than there used to be as time goes on, but a lot of the old timers are still Jewish and I don't see the anti-Semitism at all there. But you see in the jury pool, that's where you're going to find the anti-Semitism. Well, because they mirror uh, the society and the increase in, uh, in hate crimes against Jews in New York. I mean, it's massive. So there's your jury. Is there any way if somebody gets a conviction that he can appeal based on the fact that there is anti-Semitism in the jury? Is that possible at all? It's possible, but you're going to have to really dig up some prior comments um, that were left out, that the, the juror the, didn't admit it during voir dire. Um, it's not easy. And certainly people are going to hide their uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, they're going to just keep it close to their vest and do what they've got to do in their mind and convict. It's not easy, but I'll say this. You know, I don't ever feel when I start a trial that I'm going to lose based on either who my client is or certainly based on his religion. And I remember with the John Gotti uh, jury, um, they all said, all 12 of them, when the case started, we know that he's guilty, but we're going to be willing to keep an open mind. That's the best that we could do. 23 days later in trial, he walked out. So, you know, unconvicted. So I think that if you have a good lawyer, if you have someone that has a track record of winning, I think you've got a chance to beat the government. I don't care what the case is. Now, as a criminal defense attorney, if you have a Jewish defendant on trial who's very visibly Jewish. Do you ask the jurors what their feelings are towards Jews? Absolutely. I would do it. And, you know, sometimes they're going to hide it. I mean, nobody comes out and says, unless they're really stupid, you know, I just don't like Jews. So they just don't do that nowadays. They're slightly, the average anti-Semite is slightly more intelligent, not much more, but slightly more intelligent than that. There's also the anti-Zionist, that's, you know, anti-Semitism as well. I ask, and sometimes you can see in their face, when they turn away, when they're answering you, they can't look you in the eye. You make a mental note and you get them off the jury. We're seeing with Jeffrey Lickman, one of the top criminal defense attorneys in the United States. And we're looking at all kinds of issues that affect the Jewish community. We're going to take a short break. Come right back. And when we return, we'll take some of your phone calls at 212-769-1925. 1925 you have any questions about criminal defense law or about what happens and we'll talk about you know ponzi schemes and other things which affecting the members of our community 212-769-1925 email is a wonderful way to have your questions answered is zevit talkline network.com zevit talkline network.com and we're giving away tea for two dinner for tea for two they're a non-dairy non-meat restaurant great menu in marine park brooklyn if you want i'm sorry if you want a 50 dollar gift certificate to tea for two please send me an email to zevit talkline network.com please put tea for two in the byline and give us your name address and zip code we're going to pick some winners tonight that's tea for two in brooklyn we'll be right back
You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. And we're back. Jeffrey Lichtman joined us, one of the top criminal defense attorneys in the country. We're looking at issues affecting the Jewish community. Let's go to Menachem in Maplewood, New Jersey. Your question for our guest. Go ahead, Menachem. Thank you again, Zach, for a wonderful program. Uh, uh, Mr. Lichtman, your reputation precedes you. And I wonder if you ever ran into a situation where uh, into a trial you found out uh, definitely that your defendant, that the person you were defending was guilty. You were 100% sure he was guilty. And uh, what you would do in a situation like that, as opposed to finding out before the the trial started if you were to find that out would there be any change in your action um well thanks for that question i get that a lot first of all i probably wouldn't change anything that i'm doing because for the most part when you go through the evidence in the case you can see that the client the defendant is oftentimes guilty it doesn't really change what you do as a defense lawyer because your job is to fight the evidence and try to convince the jury that what they're seeing what they're hearing isn't what they think it is. Um, Does it happen during a trial that I figure out that somebody's guilty? No. As soon as I get the evidence, I know what the deal is. It doesn't change anything, innocent or guilty. I fight the same. I don't care what the person's charged with. You know, it's not my problem when somebody gets acquitted, a a dangerous person. It's the government's problem. They're the ones that failed, not me. And Mr. Lichtman, lastly, if you were ever in a situation, and God forbid that you would ever be, that you would need a defense attorney, uh, would you be able to reveal who you would choose? You know, I I think about that a lot. Um, There's very few trial lawyers in Manhattan, in New York City, that I think are actually good trial lawyers. A lot of it is PR. Uh, A lot of it is BS. Um, But if I was looking for a trial lawyer that I thought would represent me and be competent and fight hard and be good, I can think of one only. Um, And it's a fellow from Long Island named Jimmy Fracaro is probably the only one that I would use. Some of the bigger names in New York are shockingly are completely, utterly uh, you know, not as they're frauds. Let's be honest. The frauds. Very, very interesting. Keep up the great work. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you for a good question. Okay. I want to turn to Ponzi schemes because our, unfortunately in the Jewish community, including the Orthodox Jewish community, there was some very big Ponzi schemes. There was an arrest just the other day in Lakewood, New Jersey, somebody who originally went to jail for running a scheme and then he was pardoned by Donald Trump. And the government alleges that he's doing the same thing again. There are other Ponzi schemes that are out there. So number one, when they rearrest you again, I'm just curious to know how it works. It's probably a much more difficult situation to get a defense when you've done it before and they accuse you of doing it again. Well, first of all, it's going to be tougher um, to get bail um, because uh, at least in the case uh, with the guy in Lakewood who was rearrested after he is, his sentence was commuted by President Trump, He did it, um, one of his crimes, while he was out on pretrial release. And at some point, a a judge is going to say, look, you're a danger to the community. I can't let you out. Um, The more times you're convicted, uh, there's very probable that a lot of that evidence, or even if you're accused, is going to come into the next trial. Uh, They're going to claim that it's... um, you know, background evidence of an enterprise, or they're going to claim that it's um, a similar modus operandi and it's going to come in. So yeah, the more you do, the harder it is to win. But again, um, a lot of times you can say to a jury, look, the defendant did some bad things in his life. It's going to come out in this trial. And I'm just asking you to try to put it behind you because it doesn't relate to the charge in this in this case and the jury's thinking well why should i put it behind me it tells me that he's guilty if he's done it before and what i say to a jury is look imagine if you were the defendant imagine if your your mother your father your brother your sister were sitting in this seat would you want a jury uh, to look at evidence about things that have nothing to do with the charges in the case or would you want them to just look at the charges? And juries can be fair. I mean, I found that I've had good luck with them. That they can be really fair, even if you, you're actually shocked when you get an acquittal or a hung jury. 
Now, but here in the case of, for example, the Ponzi scheme, if the government says, well, he's redo- he's doing it again, he went to prison for it, he was pardoned, he's doing the same thing again, so th- wouldn't it make sense? And it probably would be allowed to bring in evidence from the first trial. If it's, like I said, if it's the same modus operandi, the same way that they're doing it, um, yeah. I mean, they're not going to bring in the sentence that the person received, but they're going to show that the person's, that the defendant has done it before. And it's tough if it's the same type of offense. It's it's not easy with the fellow that we're using him because it just happened who got uh, arrested in Lakewood. I mean, that's a tough case because it sounds exactly like the stuff that he's done numerous times before. Um, my guess is that case is going to end in a plea. But the government can ex- extract a very tough sentence because they have the driver's seat in that case, correct? Well, not only that, Zev, you've had, you have a defendant who was had his sentence commuted by Donald Trump. Um, you've got a different Justice Department in place right now. They hate Donald Trump. So you can imagine how they feel about somebody who they believe received an inappropriate uh, gift from Trump on one of his last days in office. They're going to punish him hard. There is a case, I don't remember his name, somebody who was pardoned by Donald Trump, and they wanted, They say, well, he was acquitted of all charges, but they want to rebring some of the charges again, maybe on a state level. I, I don't remember the case, maybe you do. Steve and it's a, Okay. And can they just do that? You know, isn't it double jeopardy? But it seems like the rules are changing or being bent uh, because they don't like Donald Trump or they don't like certain people. It's upsetting because we don't have that same protection that we used to have. Well, he gave a, a federal pardon. Um, he can't do it in the state, and they brought state charges against him. Uh, they're similar, but they're not exact, so it's not double jeopardy. And uh, look, a guy like that is, is going to have a very difficult time in New York City because it's wildly anti-Trump. But there was another case, I think a member of the Jewish community who was acquitted in all charge, but they're looking to retry some part of it. And that's what I'm referring to. I just don't remember it exactly where there was a question of double jeopardy brought in. Yeah, well, you can't try, if if someone is acquitted of a crime, you can't try them on that charge again. But let me give you an example that's kind of horrifying. Let's say you go to trial in the federal system um, and you're charged with six crimes and you're acquitted of five and you're convicted of one. The law allows uh, for a judge to sentence you and take into account acquitted conduct to some degree. Now, that's not helpful. Um, so it's, it's, it's not easy. Um, if they hate you, if they want you, they're going to try to get you until they stop. Uh, you know what happened with Gotti? They tried, he was tried four times, um, before they finally gave up on him. I've had it in a number of cases where I've gotten hung juries. They've come back, they keep trying. Eventually they get tired of swinging their arms at you and they give up. Here's an email question. Uh, Israel writes, uh, please ask Jeff this question. In the from community, there are many people that get duped into committing white collar crimes by other religious people that present this scheme. It's just taking advantage of a loophole as opposed to an actual crime. We often trust each other, don't understand how these things are crimes. This includes government grant front, grant fraud, tax fraud, bank fraud. Does any of this matter to a prosecutor or jury? Um, it matters. I've got a case right now with uh, somebody from the community um, who was used as a straw man in a, in a bunch of frauds. But you've got people that have been studying um, in a yeshiva for years, and all of a sudden they come out. They don't have perhaps the secular sense um, that other people that have a different type of education have. They get taken advantage of. I found that prosecutors understand the uh, uh, defendant's role, what actually happened, because they speak to enough people. It helps. Does it necessarily uh, make the crime go away, make the charge go away? No. But does it mean that they're going to get leniency or, or certainly be handled uh, less onerously? Absolutely. You get a lot of members from the community coming to you, Jeffrey, say, please help me. Yeah, I've had them, you know, for decades over the years. And look, um, I'm Jewish and I'm a Zionist, and I find that my politics and my heart uh, with regard to Israel really align with the community. Um, and do I fight harder? You know, I, I, I wish I could say that I was a zombie, that I was a robot, and I treat everybody <laughs> the same. When I've got somebody from the community, you know, it speaks to me differently, and I, and I do feel differently about the case. What are some of the high-profile cases in the community that you dealt with over the course of time? Oh, God, I've dealt with a B&H photo back in the day. Um, I've, I've dealt with many, many, many fraud cases over the years, dozens. Um, and I've had good luck. I mean, very few people have gone to jail. 
um, that I've represented from the community. And again, you know, it's when you, when you're a Jew and you feel it, you know, in, in this society and you feel um, that there's a lot of anti-Semitism, unless you're walking around in a street in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem, you're always feeling some anti-Semitism, even in New York City when there's so many Jews. When I'm with somebody that I can relate to, because we have similar, you know, the similar head, um, I find that you can, you fight in a different way because you understand the defendant, you understand how people are looking at them, how they're perceiving them, and I think it helps for defense, and, I, and that's why I've gotten such good results for the community. Have you, Jeff Lipman, ever experienced anti-Semitism in the course of your practice, personally? Oh, all, the time. all the time. I mean, you get it from clients sometimes. They don't even know that they're being anti-Semitic because it's so deeply inbred in them. Um, yeah, I mean, the prosecutors, uh, if they feel it, they hide it. The jury, certainly, uh, you can feel it. But, I, you know, I can speak to a juror that I think is anti-Semitic because if they're anti-Semitic, they're usually angry about something. Something's happened to them in their lives uh, that has made them hate Jews so much. And if you can sort of plumb that a little bit and you can find that it's something that oftentimes has nothing to do with Jewish people that makes them uh, so hateful. And I think you can exploit it and I think you can turn them. And as I said, um, I've gotten so many acquittals and hung juries over the years uh, that I must be doing something right in terms of communicating with juries. Castillo writes, can you can your guests comment on the Rabbi Eisenman case in New Jersey? I'm not sure what that case is. I think there's a case of a rabbi at a special needs school and the government accused him of taking money from the school or misappropriating funds. If I remember correctly, maybe somebody out there can correct me. I believe that he might have been acquitted uh, out of that, but it went through a year or more of just living hell, just going through dealing with it, where they come up with sometimes with a charge and they go full force, even though they may not have the correct information. Well, I mean, that happens. If you get indicted in the federal system, even if you get acquitted, your life is a shambles when the case is over. I mean, thank God if you're acquitted, um, you don't have to go to jail. But that's probably the only good thing uh, that happens because you're completely destroyed financially. You're destroyed in the community. Everybody thinks you're guilty. They think that you're a criminal. Um, and it's brutal. And the stress of thinking that you're going to go to trial is something that really ages you over the year or so. So it's a horrible situation. What I try to do, if possible, is to avoid that indictment. If you find out about an investigation before the charges are brought, you do all that you can to prevent charges from being brought. Sometimes I've had clients charged federally, and I've been able to get the case dismissed before it goes to trial, just on a motion or just convincing the prosecutor that they're making a mistake. But I can tell you this, the best way to convince a prosecutor to back off when either in giving a low plea or even uh, dismissing the charges is convincing them that they're going to lose a trial. And that's a, a big deal. If you can convince them, and I find, that, look, when I was a younger man, Zev, I would walk in and I would pound my chest and they'd laugh at me. Um, and they'd be like, nice boy. They'd pat me on the head and say, get ready for trial. As I got older, I started winning and winning and winning. All of a sudden, when I go in there and say, look, this is how you're going to lose the trial. And this is why you should either drop the charge or give me something with no jail in terms of a plea. They listen most of the time now because nothing a prosecutor hates more than losing a trial because, my God, it's going to stop them from getting up to that next rung on the ladder of success, and they can't bear that stuff. Is there any? Are there any consequences if a prosecutor lies or plays games with the evidence or withhold it? If, if it's proven that they've done so, is there any consequence to them, or can they just do it and get away with it so therefore there's no incentive for them not to play games? Well, they get a slap on the wrist, Zev, and it's very painful. I, I can I give you an example of one thing that's horrific that still bothers me to this day. I was representing El Chapo's wife, Emma Coronel, a few years ago in a federal case in D.C. She was arrested when she got off the plane. Uh, she was in custody. And uh, the next day, the DEA told the media that she was cooperating with the government, which was an absolute lie. It put her in immediate danger, put her family, her children in Mexico in danger. Uh, from what I understand, the agent that uh, said that lie to the press 
It was discovered. There was absolutely no punishment at all. It happens all the time. This is, I mean, look, just look what's going on in the White House right now, Zev. You've got a president who's accused by government witnesses of taking a $10 million bribe with his imbecile son. All sorts of crimes that occurred. Nobody's even reporting on it, let alone anybody being punished in any kind of real way. So you can't expect the prosecutor to uh, get punished for his misdeeds. That's a problem. And it used to be, and listen, to be honest, uh, Jeffrey, I wasn't a fan of the American Civil Liberties Union. But one thing I admired about them, they, they took on unpopular causes and they went to court over it. So they fought for neo-Nazis to march in Skokie and et cetera. They even defended the Jewish Defense League in the heyday. Now they will only defend people that they like or in the sync with their ideology. Our country has changed. It's not for the better. As much as I didn't like what the ACLU did, but I admire the fact that they took on unpopular causes, and now they don't. So I think our civil liberties have been eroded uh, over the course of the last four to six years or longer. I agree with you 100%. I mean, the country is completely divided uh, down the middle. It used to be that we could have discourse with people that we didn't agree with, and it was pleasant, and it wasn't vicious. Nowadays, um, you know, you really can't trust anybody who feels differently than you politically, they'll sell you out in two seconds. Um, they're not your friends. And I tell that to people. I even I tell it to the, the handful of Jewish friends I have who don't really get it yet. I said, stop. You know, you've got to stop uh, mixing with these people because they're not your friends. They don't like you. Oh, but my God, uh, you know, uh, I'm liberal. I believe in abortion. I believe in welfare. I believe in trans rights. This is These are Jewish things. I said, guess what? The same people that believe that are the Democrats, and they hate your guts. So, you know, people don't understand. They have to find out the hard ways of. I wish they would. We're seeing one of the top criminal defense attorneys in the country with a very high 50% success rate, which is pretty, which is great in the federal system. And he is Jeffrey Lichtman, and uh, we'll continue our conversation right after these messages. And you can keep on sending your emails. I'm getting some more emails coming to Zev at talklinenetwork.com, Zev at talklinenetwork.com. If you'd like to call us, 212-769-1925, 212-769-1925 is the number to call us. Coming up a little later tonight, Rabbi Mutt, Affliction, he was a former drug dealer. I don't think he was convicted, but he was a former drug dealer. He also is a rapper. Today he is a Chabad rabbi. We'll talk to him. And I think Judge David... Um, uh, Kornblum, Kirschblum will join us as well sometime during the course of the night. Again, if you'd like to win a $50 gift certificate to Tifa 2, please send me an email to Zev at TalkLineNetwork.com. Zev at TalkLineNetwork.com. Please put Tifa 2 in the byline and please include your name, address, zip code, and phone number so we will pick some winners tonight. That's Zev at TalkLineNetwork.com. We'll be right back.
Thank you for listening to this episode of Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. Please call us with your questions and comments at 212-769-1925. That's 212-769-1925. Or email us at zevbrenner at gmail.com. And we're back. Jeffrey Lickman, one of the top criminal defense attorneys in the United States. Great success rate. And uh, we're taking some of your phone calls. Let's go to Stan and Forrest Hills. Your question for our guests. Go ahead, Stan. Thank you. Counselor, probably a DA that you would like very much is DA Bragg in Manhattan. Seems to, you know, not bring people to trial in many cases. Have you had any running run-ins with him in any cases in the past year or so? What's his name? Alvin Bragg. He's the district oh, attorney. Of course. Um, you know, Bragg runs the office now. Um, you know, look, sometimes I, I think he's obviously concerned about publicity. He's concerned about um, himself. That's the first choice when he determines what's going to happen with the case. But I have to tell you, I've got a, a very sensitive case right now uh, that's in the paper tomorrow. It'll be in the New York Post about um, an Israeli um, who worked in the consulate um, and was arrested for attempted murder. Um, a horrible case outside of a bar months ago, earlier this year, and the office has been incredibly fair so far with him. I didn't expect it. I don't expect much from Alvin Bragg, and uh, I suspect that it's, it's a big enough case because it's in the newspaper. It's been all over the Israeli media. Um, they've been fair, shockingly fair. So uh, I, I give them a little more credit than I would have yesterday. But let me ask you this. You, usually, any diplomatic cases, especially someone from another country who's, they usually get them to leave. So you, you'll probably wind up doing that. Am I right? They may not even go there because usually diplomatic situations, they throw them out of the country. They don't get to go to trial, right? Well, he's not a diplomat. This was just somebody that was working, um, you know, in, in, without any kind of diplomatic immunity and any of that. And, um, you know, he very much wants to stay in New York, but he's not a citizen, obviously. He's here on a visa. And uh, that office listened to us. They listened to our pitch on a case that was captured completely on video. There was no defense to it. It was a horrible, it is a horrible case, but they have been decent. Um, I don't want to talk too much about it because, God help me, if I say something, what's going on in the case, uh, they'll, uh, they'll, it may turn uh, in terms of how they do it. What do you it. think? It what do you think of the way Bragg has been uh, sort of uh, criticized by the media and by, uh, uh, you know, different segments of the legal profession? What, what do you think of uh, how he's handled his situation? And not, and not necessarily your situation, but overall. Well, as a defense lawyer, obviously I like it because he's soft in my mind. He's soft on crime. And somebody who has to live here too, however, and deal with the crime, I don't like it. Um, you know, some of the things that he's doing is ridiculous. I think he deserves the criticism. So, you, so you, you play both you play both ends from the middle? Is that what you're saying? It sounds like that's what you're saying. I don't play both ends in the middle. As a defense lawyer, it's my job, it's my career, it's my passion. So I take any advantage I can get. As somebody who lives in a, in a place where there's a lot of crime and the criminals are not being prosecuted, I don't necessarily like it. I can certainly understand the criticism. Anyway, Stan, thank, okay. you, thank you for an interesting question. Okay. Right. Nope. Let me tell, let me take an email question. Well, this is a very good email question. So let me read what Jesse has to say. Jesse goes, I've always heard that the federal prosecutors don't offer a good plea deal unless you cooperate with them. From Jews are not allowed to inform on another person. How can a religious Jew get a good plea deal without turning against someone else? That's a good question in theory. First of all, from Jews, sometimes they cooperate. Um, I, I trust me on this. Sometimes they cooperate. You can get very good plea offers without cooperating. I get them all the time. I've gotten them five days before a federal trial in the Southern District where they gave somebody who was uh, caught dead on tape uh, with violence. Um, I've gotten them no jail. If they think they're going to lose the trial, if they think there's a chance they're going to lose the trial, if they think they're going to be embarrassed during the trial, they give you the offer you want no matter how low it is. So it depends. If you want to work hard as a defense lawyer, you can have whatever you want in this profession. You can win. You can win trial after trial. You just have to sacrifice and put the time in. 
Now, I want to get back to Ponzi schemes. Now, what are some of the recourses that a victim has? If somebody has been victimized in a Ponzi scheme, should they go to the authorities? Will they get different kind of redress by suing? What do you recommend? Because we're seeing a preponderance, unfortunately, of Ponzi cases that are taking place, not just in the Jewish room, but in general. I, I think you're better off sort of hitching your, your cart to the government. If they go after somebody and they can seize some assets uh, before the trial even starts, the proceeds of the crime, there's a decent chance they're going to get some of that back. If you just sue them in court, they're going to move money. Look, they're criminals, remember, that, that are doing this to you. So they're certainly not going to abide by the law. you got a better chance going to the government, having them hopefully uh, get a conviction and get some of your money back. Now, what kind of cases does the federal government convict? I know Ponzi schemes, they do. What about some other cases of fraud? Does every fraud case end up in criminal court or do some end up just in civil court? What's the criteria? Sometimes they're civil. Um, they, they, they can't bring a criminal case if they feel that the evidence perhaps isn't strong enough and it just stays civil. Uh, it also depends on the dollar amount. I mean, there's a zillion uh, civil cases over money, over allegations of fraud that just aren't significant enough uh, for the federal or even the state government to bring. They don't have the resources. So, are there any, so what kinds of cases, for example, we covered a story about a Passover program that, uh, that went bust and people lost money and the owner claims that he was fished and he's a victim and other people say that money was taken. And I know that people said the FBI was involved. I don't know if think they really were. But so is, is that kind of case would end up in a criminal court or would be in a civil court? You know, sometimes people bring civil cases and that turns it into a criminal case. I've often sued on behalf of victims of, of fraud. I've done it all over the country and gotten money back. Um, sometimes the federal government just doesn't want to get involved. Maybe it's for 800000 or a million. It's not big enough. So I sue and I, and I get the money. But a lot of times the reason why the defendant pays up is because he figures, look, if I fight this and I'm, I'm deposed and I have to answer questions under oath, I'm going to have to lie in order to have a chance to win this lawsuit. If I lie, the defense counsel who's got connections with federal authorities, they're going to take that deposition transcript and they're going to turn it over to the feds. And that may trigger a federal criminal case. So I find that if you sue people, if the case is, is a bad one, oftentimes they're going to give you what you want. Or if there's a criminal investigation and you get sued, oh, they're going to do what they can to get rid of that civil case because money is not as important to people as freedom. Although sometimes you should be surprised. People sometimes value money more. All right, Elliot writes, uh, hi, I know of a case that a person was convicted. Turns out that the main witness in the case was convicted in criminal court. Can the case be turned around because the main witness was convicted? Well, the main witness is oftentimes convicted, which is why they're cooperating. They plead guilty in an effort to try to get a lower sentence. So the only way you have a chance of getting a new trial, I've gotten it, um, is either because the government withheld evidence that was so significant that had it been turned over to the defense, there's a very good likelihood that the verdict, a, a conviction, would have changed to an acquittal. Or if there's um, an incompetent defense lawyer at trial, and if there had been a competent defense lawyer, the, the verdict would have been different. I've had some horrible cases, disgusting cases, in which a client was convicted, sentenced to a de facto life in prison, but because of an incompetent trial counsel, we've gotten the conviction vacated and they've gotten out of jail. Wow. So, uh, but to win on appeal is even tougher, right? Well, it's tough to win on appeal, but I find that sometimes instead of an appeal, it'd be a motion for a new trial due to newly discovered evidence. You can win them. I mean, I've opened up many convictions over the years, and I'm, I don't consider myself an appellate lawyer. Um, as I've gotten older, I do mostly trials now, but we still take on cases with people that are unfairly convicted. And and a very decent percentage, we can open up the conviction. Again, you've got to do the investigation. You've got to do the work. And if you do the work, I find the one thing that's great about America, Zev, is that if you work hard enough, no matter where you came from, no matter what you've got, you've got a chance to succeed. By the way, is there what is your secret that you're able to get so many wins compared to other criminal defense attorneys that are out there? You know, I find that most criminal defense attorneys 
They're concerned about the cases they take. They want to look good. They want to take the winners. They're terrified about what society thinks about them, what the government thinks about them. I just outwork them. And I've been doing that since I'm a young lawyer. On weekends, I'm working. On holidays, I'm working. As a young lawyer, I worked sometimes, you know, 100, 200 straight days because I didn't want to fail. You know, it's easy to fail. And it's easy to blame it on everybody else when you fail. But to succeed, you've got to outwork the other guy. I remember getting ready for the Gotti trial. The whole world thought we were going to lose. And I remember thinking, there's no way I'm losing this case. And sure enough, he walked out uh, and, and was free. And you're listening to the Talk Line Network over WSNR 620 AM Metro New York, WVIP 93.5 FM HD2, WJPR 1640 AM in Highland Park in Edison, New Jersey, online at talklinenetwork.com and our 24-hour day listen line, 641793. We're doing Jeffrey Lickman, famed criminal defense attorney. Here's another email question for you. What is attorney Lickman's advice in finding a good criminal defense lawyer other than him, of course? It seems that certain lawyers are very popular in our community. They never had any wins. All their clients take deals that seem to be and to that seem to an outside observer to be bad. I'll tell you this. I'm astounded, frankly, at how bad some of the lawyers are that are representing the community. They get pushed for reasons that I can only hazard a guess as to why they would be pushed on people in the community. They don't win. They're not good. Um, people get fooled because they're naive in the community. What I would say is first thing is ignore what you see online. A lot of times people will uh, get ads in Google to make them rise to the top. They'll put in code words on their website, the greatest uh, lawyer since you know sliced bread, and people will think, well, they're good. Then you find out that they don't win trials. But I think with the community, you have to find lawyers that actually win. And if somebody says that they've won, well, track that case down and find out what the media said about them, uh, find out what a judge said about them, see what they actually did to win. The community consistently, and I've seen it now, I'm representing somebody in the community, I'm astounded at how bad the lawyers are. And it's the same tired people that lose trial after trial after trial. You'd think that when you start losing high profile trial one after another, Maybe there's a reason. Maybe it's the lawyer. No, it makes sense. In other words, your suggestion is if you're looking for a criminal offense lawyer, look at his win ratio. Well, I think that's part of it. I mean, look, sometimes you lose a trial and you have no chance of winning, but you have to win some of them. Uh, you have to occasionally win a trial. You've got lawyers that are getting hired in the community that the only trials they've ever won are ones that are almost impossible to lose. You have to make a more of an effort because the education in finding a lawyer, Zev, the education ends usually on the day that's one day too late to get a good lawyer. So you really have to be careful. This is the most important decision of your life. If you make the wrong decision, you could lose your liberty. No, very true. Have you ever taken a case knowing that the chance of you winning would be almost nil, but you figure give it a shot at it anyway? You know, normal people, mentally healthy people would think that way. When you're a criminal defense lawyer to do this kind of work, you have to be able to delude yourself to some degree. Um, I don't think there's ever been a trial that I've had that I thought I was going to lose, including El Chapo. And I got hired three months before the trial started and I was stuck with two lawyers from another city who didn't know what they were doing. So I even thought I was going to win that case. And I say the same thing. I probably shouldn't say this on the radio, but I say that or on TV as well. Um, I say the same thing to every client when we start the case. I don't care how badly you think the evidence is against you. By the time I do the summation in your case, in your trial, when I sit down, you're going to be convinced that you're going to win. And if you're not convinced, I'll give you your feedback. That's how sure I am, because I am convinced that I can find a hole in any case, no matter how bad the evidence is. Uh, Ellie wants to clarify the question he asked before. He goes, sorry, my question was the main witness of the case was convicted in a different case, a separate case, nothing to do with the case. He was a witness that have any bearing on the case of somebody who got convicted based on that testimony. 
Well, if it's hidden from the defendant, then yeah, it could be used as, as an appeal. But almost every trial we have, you've got you know real bums uh, that are testifying against the defendant, and they've got a long history of, of, of criminality. And all of that comes out usually on the direct examination by the government. But certainly we go a little farther. We get uh, the, the files from all the cases. We see every bad thing that they've done, and we pound them with it on cross-examination. Bummer writes, question, how is it morally proper to defend somebody you know is guilty? Well, I'm not here. Uh, I'm not the judge. I'm not the jury. I'm not God. I'm here defending the American Constitution. It's, it feels great morally. I like to win. I don't care how bad uh, what the client's done. I don't feel good about helping somebody uh, get an acquittal that they've done bad things. I feel bad for the victims. But this is my job. I mean, this is what I'm, I'm sworn to do. If I laid down... I would, it would be unethical. It would be wrong. I've got to fight to the death for these clients. Morally, I have no problem with it at all. I don't. I sleep well at night. I mean, I don't sleep well at night, Zeb. But it's got for reasons <laughs> having nothing to do with, with your with your with do. cases. You're doing or they hire you? Doing a, you're doing a good job for them. That's what they hire you to do. That's right. Exactly. Here's another question uh, from Lakewood, New Jersey. Oh, when would you allow your client to inform somebody else in order to get a better deal where it may be in violation of Jewish law? Well, you know, I, when I was a younger lawyer, Zeb, I never represented cooperators. I refused to. I just it was so against it because I felt these are the people that are ruining the lives of my other clients. As I've gotten older, I realize, you know, I don't, you know, walk in their shoes. I don't suffer the way these people do. If they want to cooperate, um, I'm not happy with it. Uh, if I if I'm so turned off by it, if it's something that's so bad, I'll quit the case because I don't think that a, a defendant, a client, should have somebody who's emotionally uh, not completely into the defense. But for the most part, I let people make that decision. I guide them. I give them the advice. If that's what they want to do, that's what they do. It doesn't happen very often um, in my practice. People don't hire me usually to cooperate. They hire me to fight and, and win a trial. There are other lawyers that just simply represent cooperators. They never go to trial. And that's it. They turn their clients over to the government, and they're barely involved after that. Do most criminal defense attorneys suggest that the client take a plea deal because it's easier, cheaper, and more guaranteed that they will get a better deal than if they were convicted? 99% do. I find a lot of the big law firms, the big white-collar firms, they'll talk a tough game about how hard they're going to fight. They'll fight, 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 and then as soon as you run out of money, you got to take a plea or I quit the case. Um, that's oftentimes what happens. You got to see when somebody goes to trial. Sometimes you hire defense lawyers, they never go to trial. And that's a problem because that means that the government feels the same way. They know that they're not going to go to trial. There's never any threat of a trial. So they know they can do whatever they want to the defendant. Now, when the government gives a plea deal, do they sometimes make a better deal? Or that's pretty much the deal they give you is what they plan on implementing and won't change at all? Oh, yeah. The plea deals uh, can change. I mean, I've had cases where uh, the, the numbers come down drastically. I was hired um, by, by a lawyer in February uh, in, for a case, a horrible case, where the day that he hired me, he had been begging for a felony conviction, which would have gotten him disbarred. His lawyer was begging for a felony. They gave him the felony. He called me up. I said, I'll get you a misdemeanor. I think it's ridiculous for you to lose your career at age 28 uh, for what you did. Guess what? He hired me. We got a misdemeanor and he's still practicing. You know, you have to just fight. If they think you're going to go to trial and they think that you can win and you've got a lawyer who's got a reputation for winning a trial, somehow they manage to lower their offers. Well, amazing because you hear all kinds of stories out there. Our guests for a little while longer, Jeffrey Lickman, he's a top criminal defense attorney here in New York, 30 years experience. He has a very high 50% success rate. And we're looking at, at different matters that affect our community when it comes to criminal defense. We're going to be right back. Don't go away. Stay tuned. If you'd like to participate, our numbers again are 212-769-1925. 212-769-1925. Email is a wonderful way to have your questions answered. Send me an email to zevatalklinenetwork.com, Talkline network.com again we're still giving away fifty dollar certificates for tea for two in marine park in brooklyn they're a non-dairy non-meat parva restaurant great menu simply tantalizing you'll enjoy the taste send me an email to zev at talklinenetwork.com please put tea for two in the byline give us your name address and zip code we're going to pick some more winners tonight we're going to be right back
Thank you for listening to this episode of Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. Please call us with your questions and comments at 212-769-1925. That's 212-769-1925. Or email us at zevbrenner at gmail.com. And we're back. Jeffrey Lichtman just with us for a little while longer, one of the top criminal defense attorneys in the country, representing from John Gotti to El Chapo to some other uh, prominent people that are in the news and has a pretty high success ratio in getting people acquitted. What's been your biggest challenge over the course of time? I think the, the biggest challenge I've had is continuing to operate at the highest level in terms of the work output. Um, time after time after time, it gets repetitive and I have to find new challenges to keep the effort the same level. Otherwise, without that kind of effort, you just can't win. So once I feel like I can't do it, my old boss, Jerry Shargell, once said to me, this is a young man's game, um, that at some point you just get too old doing it because the work is just too hard. I, I still enjoy it. I still can do it. And I also can get things done a lot faster than when I was a, a younger lawyer. Um, but I think that's probably the biggest challenge is continuing to work so hard. Edward writes, I once received a ticket for a moving violation. I went to trial at the DMV. I read the back of the summons and it states that the complainant, the police officer, needs to print and sign the summons. The summons clearly only had the signed name of the officer, not the printed name. I told the judge that the summons is defective due to the missing printed name. The judge said the missing printed name was not necessary and found me guilty. What's the point of printed law when a judge can overrule printed law during a trial? You know, that's a real conundrum you got there, Edward. Uh, I don't do many uh, moving violation cases, um, but I find that, you know, the, the judges don't care as much when you get to the lower level of courts. The judges don't care. The prosecutors don't care. Um, usually you can get out of those kind of uh, tickets um, with a little bit of an effort. It sounds like you had some bad luck. Another email question. Can you ask your guests to explain how sentencing works? Why does it seem that two people charged with the same crime get different sentences? Do they give a harsher punishment for going to trial? Well, they're not supposed to give uh, a harsher punishment for going to trial, not much more significant, at least in the federal system. Um, you know, look, there's a lot of different things that impact the sentence. Two people could be convicted of the same crime and done the same conduct, but perhaps one person has a criminal history that the other one does. And perhaps one person is taking care of an elderly parent and there's nobody else in the family that can do so. So that can help them avoid jail. Perhaps they've had some the difficulty they've overcome in life. So there's many things in people's backgrounds that impact the sentence that have nothing at all to do with the crime charged. As a defense lawyer, you have to figure out all of that stuff as quickly as you can, because if you miss an opportunity to get a lower sentence, you may never get that chance back. Okay, let's go to New Jersey. Your question and comments for our guests. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Mr. Lichtman, have, uh, with the kind of uh, uh, chaos and sensitivities going on today, do you ever find yourself uh, concerned about uh, yours and your loved one's safety when handling a, uh, a high-profile case? Yeah, I would think that's fair, of course. I mean, I'm not crazy. Um, do I feel concern? Yes. Um, has it stopped me from doing the work that I do? As of today, it has not. I don't know that I'm always going to feel that way. Um, I feel somewhat protected. I take precautions. Um, but, yeah, there's always crazy people out there. I mean, there's a case, as I was talking about, the Israeli that's in the newspapers, at least now online. It'll be in the paper. I've already gotten a crazy uh, phone call message left um, on my office voicemail. I get uh, threats every day almost of my career via email or some other opportunity for people to contact me. Um, look, you don't do this kind of work if you scare easily. You just don't. It's the wrong work for you if you scare easily. And uh, to be honest, I like guns. So that helps also. So you're, you're protected. I'm protected. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Okay. No, listen, we live in scary times and uh, people, there are a lot of crazy people running around too. 
Uh, just getting back to the Ponzi scheme, because we're getting you know, a lot of interest in that. So in a case where there are multiple people that have uh, lost money in a Ponzi scheme, how does it work? Should they hire a lawyer to go to the government? Should they do it on their own? What's the procedure? I think it helps if they hire a lawyer because we can sort of cut through the red tape. We can get their attention. I mean, I, I've, I've had cases for clients where they've told me they've been defrauded. Um, they've hired me. I've gone to the feds. And I've gotten them to bring federal criminal charges against the uh, the perpetrator. So it helps to have a lawyer. You have a good lawyer who's got connections, who's got the ability uh, to talk to either the FBI or the federal government. And it usually uh, goes a little faster. That's the way to do it. Now, here's something interesting, which I don't know if you've seen, but uh, somebody had sent me. There was a case, unfortunately, somebody who has a showroom in Borough Park was was going on trial for molestation of a young girl. And he basically his lawyer said to the judge that the three weeks are coming up, which is an unlucky period. They wanted to put off the trial or because of the three-week period, which we're in right now. And the judge was berating, says, you, you, I'm Jewish and I know the religion and don't make up these things for unlucky days. I have unlucky days too. Went through a whole tired against the three weeks. Is that something, a legitimate thing that one can bring up for a judge? And I, of course, get your reaction when the judge just came up with this whole thing saying that this is baloney, this three weeks thing. Well, I mean, the, the, the judge may have been wrong um, in terms of his opinion, but I think on the law, he's certainly right. You can't, you know, pick and choose when you want the trial to go if you think something's coming up. Have I been able to get delays? Sure. Um, but I don't think I've been able to get it based on uh, somebody's religion unless they're going to have the 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 trial start on uh, Passover, which they don't do because those are court holidays anyway. Um, I find that uh, when I get a trial date, I like to stick by the trial date because I don't like to ask the government. I don't like to ask the judge for anything. I don't want any favors. All I want is a fair trial. I don't want them doing anything for me that's going to make them think down the line they're going to want something back. But some, for example, your Passover might be on the court calendar, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, but a holiday like Shavuos may not be. So that would be some a reasonable to say to a judge, my client cannot appear on Shavuos, right? I think that if you're an observant Jew, um, you can say to a judge, look, don't start the trial on September, you know, the day after Labor Day, um, that you can perhaps uh, delay it until you know, maybe the end of October, because so many of these days are observed by my client. And that oftentimes can work. Okay. Now, is there, like, for example, like Purim, and I'm just trying to get parameters of, like, Purim, for example, <laughs> or Tisha uh, how, how far can you go? I would say that Purim is probably not going to gonna float. Uh, you want to you stick to the more, uh, more important holidays. I would stick to most of the ones in the fall um, and, of course, Passover. I think those are your best bet. Now, before we let you go, if somebody gets in trouble, what's the procedure? What should they say, not say, when they have an IRS agent or an FBI agent or somebody else comes knocking at their door, uh, which I guess is usually early in the morning? That's the, Is that the MO? That's what they do early in the morning because they figure that you'll be half awake and you'll say anything and you're more likely to be present at that location. You never speak to uh, law enforcement. You never try to talk your way out of it. I don't care who it is. If it's an IRS agent and he's got a, a pencil in his pocket, you still don't speak to him. You hire a lawyer first. A lot of times people get arrested where the police come to the door and say, look, I just want to hear your side of the story and then I'm going to let you go. They're allowed to lie to you. So you just say, look, I'm not speaking to you. I've, I've got a case right now with a, a young man who's accused of sexual assault. The police officer came and said, look, I just want to hear your side of the story. I called the police officer up after I was retained and said, we're never speaking to you. Guess what? The case disappeared because they couldn't get that evidence from the defendant, from the, 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 the target that they were hoping to get. Is there something wrong here? If you lie to a federal official, I, I, I don't know about a police officer, but if you lie, you can go get a, be brought up on charges for lying to a federal official, but yet they can lie to you and it's, get away with it. Completely unfair, and you just cited the law exactly accurately. It's unfair. 
Now, does that prohibition also extend to a, a New York City or a New York State police officer, or is that only a federal official that you can get in trouble if you no, lie to them? Police officers do it as well. Now, prosecutors aren't going to lie to you. At least they're not supposed to lie to you. But you can. I've I've seen cases in which uh, the FBI agents have arrested a bunch of people. They put one in one room and one in the other, and they said the fellow in the other room is speaking about you right now. He's giving you up. You should give him up. Meanwhile, the guy in the other room never said a word. Now I'm saying, but you can get in trouble when you lie to an FBI agent or a federal official. Is that rule hole? Can you one lie? To, will one get in trouble if they lie to a New York police officer or a New York state officer? Is that rule only on federal? Is it on a New York City and state level as well? They can charge you in the state level as well. They'll charge you with obstruction of justice or something like that. The the, the advice is clear. You never speak to them. Never, never, never. You hire a lawyer first. Speak to the lawyer. Let the lawyer deal with them. So that's the best situation is you don't cooperate. You just say, my lawyer will be in touch with you. Exactly. Down the line, you may change your mind. You may have your lawyer work towards a cooperation deal. But at the beginning, you never take this matter into your own hands. It's suicide. What other advice would you give to people out there that might get themselves in trouble? I, I would say this. Don't speak on the phone. If, God forbid, you get arrested and you're in a holding cell, don't speak on the phone and because they're going to record all those conversations. You don't speak about the case ever on the phone. And I would say to your community, again, make more of an effort to find lawyers that actually win as opposed to lawyers that, for whatever God knows what reason, they're pushed on the community. Now, as far as you know, are there any other lawyers out there that have a similar win ratio to what you have? I don't know that there's many lawyers right now in New York City that have gotten as many hung juries and acquittals as I have in the last few decades. If there are, I don't know who they are. Um, I win a lot. And look, that's the reason why I've been successful is because if you win a lot, the people hire you. It doesn't happen by accident. Now, is there a book in the offing? Uh, no, never. Um, no. Are you not no. going to write a book? My brain is filled with too, with too many stuff, too many things about <laughs> cases. I forget a lot of the good stuff. And, uh, you know, I, when I'm done with this, I'm going to be done with it. I don't want to think about it anymore. You don't want to write about it anymore. Okay. And, and I know you're active in the Jewish community as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, it's uh, the Jewish community is very close to my heart, as is Israel. I don't know that there's a more important cause to me than Israel right now. And that certainly is, uh, in the court of public opinion, is having a, a bad day. Even in the United States, a lot of Democrats are not as supportive of Israel as they used to be. I mean, I think I saw a recent poll uh, that uh, more Democrats than, than, uh, than less support Hamas uh, against Israel. And I say Hamas because that's the Palestinian government. Um, they're the ones in charge. I mean, I don't want to hear, oh, God, you know, free the Palestinians from Hamas. They voted them into power and they're wildly popular. Let's call a spade a spade. But more Democrats support Hamas than they do Israel, which is the only democratic nation in the Middle East and a great ally to America. Hamas, the Hamas government, they kill Americans. But this is what the Democratic Party's become. I used to be a Democrat when I was younger. It's not the same party anymore. Have you had any case where you had to defend the country of Israel? Or any, aside from the consulate case that you mentioned earlier? I haven't, but it would be my greatest honor. Jeffrey, look, when people want to get a hold of you and find out more information, how can they do so? Um, they can find me on the internet, it's, or they can go to my website, it's jeffreylickman.com. Uh, they can email me, they can call me. I'm available 24 7, sadly, uh, for the most part. Somebody in my office will get back to you. And um, I'm happy to speak about any case you've got. And we really appreciate you being here with us. This is the first time, but we're looking forward to having you back again because I, you know, a lot of people were interested in what you had to say. And they really thank you for the work that you're doing for all of us. Thank you, Zeb. It's been a pleasure. Jeffrey Lifman, top criminal defense attorney here on the Talk Line Network. Thank you for.